Our son George was so excited. I mean, his brother David was going to marry Caitlin, the girl of his dreams. And actually, George had introduced his brother to Caitlin because he had been a friend of the family for years. And so he was really, really happy for both, both of them. And uh, they're going to get married on this incredibly beautiful beach on a small, secluded island in New Zealand, of all places. And the wedding party was incredibly close and intimate. There was David and Caitlin, you know, our son and his his wife-to-be, and Caitlin's sister, Molly. And then there was George, and then there was Julie and myself. That was it. That was it. And I had the amazing privilege of performing the wedding ceremony of my own son. And George, his brother, had the privilege of being David's best man. I'm telling you, we could hardly wait. So, you know, we left from New Orleans, and George uh, was leaving from Chicago. And on the day this plane was supposed to take off, you know, a, a friend of George's drove him to the airport. And then it happened. George had a major Lyme disease crash. And just literally all of the energy just drained out of him. It's like the, the flu times 10. And, 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 his, and his arms and his legs just felt like they weighed 300 pounds, and he just ached all over from head to toe. Now, from George's experience of battling Lyme's disease for, for close to 10 years, he knew that this was a bad one. And he knew that a crash like this was one that he would take normally a whole week for him to recover from on good conditions. And a 14-hour plane flight would only make it even worse. And so just minutes away from the airport, George said to his friend who was driving him, turn around, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to take me home. And so they drove back, and George missed the flight. He missed the wedding He was absolutely devastated. David, his brother, was devastated. Here was his wedding day, and now neither one of his brothers were going to be able to stand at his side as he got married. And although God gave us an uncanny peace about that situation, still, we were all very disappointed. You know, I never really asked George, but I imagine that at some point, George must have said to God, God, How could you let this happen? Let me ask you, have you ever been disappointed in God? Have you ever felt like he somehow let you down? Maybe you raised your child for the Lord with all kinds of love and affection, and they chose just to walk away. You you have no relationship with them today. And maybe, and as a Christian, as a believer, you wonder, God, how, how, how did that happen? What do you do with that? Maybe a loved one in the prime of his life just suddenly dies, leaving you stunned and all alone. Maybe your marriage partner just unexpectedly, out of the blue, announces he's gone, she's gone, the mind's made up, the lawyers have been contacted, it's over. Maybe you're stuck and have been fighting a a debilitating disease or illness and it's just got your, your, your world turned upside down. Maybe a close friend, somebody you love, somebody you shared life with, whom you kind of figured would always be one of your closest friends as you grow old together. And maybe something happens and that friendship just, just abruptly ended. And you wonder, God, what happened? How could you have let that happen? We've been talking all year about having a heart for God. And few things can harpoon our hearts for God more than a senseless tragedy that we just, we just can't make rhyme or reason of, or, or a completely unexpected loss, or a, just being blindsided by the searing pain of losing somebody that you love. And as a believer in God, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you know that God is all-powerful. He can do anything. You believe in him, and you know that if he wanted to, he could just Boom, say the word, and that cancer would be gone. You know that God is sovereign. He's in control of everything. He could easily have kept that drunk driver off the road that night when your son or daughter was driving down that lonely highway, but he didn't, and you can't help but wonder, why, God? Why? 
Mary and Martha, two very close friends of Jesus, knew exactly what that felt like because they themselves had experienced that very, thing, very same thing when their brother, Lazarus, died. And this morning, what we want to do is to turn in God's Word to their story and learn how to handle the heartache of feeling God has let you down. So if you've got your Bibles, I hope you do, uh, turn to... Uh, Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 11. We've got some little black pew Bibles there. uh, And I encourage you to follow along. This is just one of my favorite passages uh, in the Bible. So, John, chapter 11. We're going to read. start off with the first 16 verses. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews were trying to stone you, and yet you're going back there? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by, his, by this world's light. <clears throat> it is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. And after he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And of course, the disciples being so literal minded, uh, they, they replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll, he'll get better. He'll wake up. And Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So here we are, we're introduced to three of the closest personal friends that Jesus had on earth, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Jesus never owned a home of his own, but let me tell you, whenever he was in Bethany, you know, there was a home in which he was always welcome, the home of these two sisters and her brother, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Most scholars believe that Jesus probably spent the night there in their home whenever he was on the way to Jerusalem or traveling away from it, because just about a mile and a half away, just east of the Mount of Olives. Now, in verse 2, John tells us that this Mary is the same Mary who, in one of the most beautiful acts of devotion and love recorded in scriptures, when she anointed the feet of Jesus with this costly, expensive uh, perfume called nard, and then wiped his feet with her hair. Jesus was deeply touched. Listen to what he said in Mark 14, 9 after this. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. That's how special she was to him. But now, now <clears throat> the atmosphere of this very happy home has changed. The mood had become very somber and very, very serious because, you see, Lazarus was sick, really sick. In fact, he's on the very threshold of death. But there's nothing to worry about. Come on, I mean, you know, Mary and Martha, they are personal friends with Jesus. They are followers and they believe. They've seen Jesus heal every single sickness that ever was brought before him. And they believe, they know, they don't have any doubt that Jesus could easily, easily, easily cure their brother just Heal him of his disease, his sickness. And so they just send a message to Jesus, said, Lord, the one whom you love is sick. They don't even have to tell his name. They know that when they send this message, he'll know that they're talking about his dear friend, Lazarus. So here's where this gets interesting, though. In verse 5, John specifically is very careful to tell us Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. No question about that. Verse 6, yet, yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, He stayed where he was two more days. 
And here's the kicker. This passage makes it absolutely perfectly clear that Jesus intentionally stayed away from Bethany for the express purpose so that his friend Lazarus would die. Now, what's the deal with that? He loved them and he stayed away so Lazarus would die? What what kind of love is that? I mean, think about it. You'd think that if he loved them, I mean, the second he heard about Lazarus being sick, man, he just dropped everything and made a beeline to Bethany and cured uh, Lazarus right away. Or, you know, he didn't even have to do that. If he wanted to, Jesus could have done one of those long-distance healings. Remember the Roman centurion that came up to Jesus and said, you know, my servant's sick, and he's not here. If you'll come to him, I know that you can heal him. And, and, and Jesus said, look, I hadn't seen faith like this. This is incredible. Your, your servant right now, he's healed. I don't know how many miles that way he was, but he was long distance. He could have done that for Lazarus. He just said, Lazarus, be healed. And Lazarus would have jumped out of bed and been fine. Just say the word. But he didn't do that. And Lazarus died. How do you handle something like that? Well, let's explore a couple reasons, a couple ways. Number one, trust that God loves you even when he allows tragedies to come into your life. Trust that God loves you even when he allows tragedies to come into your life. You know, sometimes when somebody you love is, is sick and we, and we fall on our knees and we pray and pray and pray for Jesus to come and heal that person and he doesn't, sometimes that causes people to think, well... I tried, you know, I, I, I prayed, you know, God must not be there. All this prayer business must not really work. And, and if God is there, obviously he didn't care about my situation. And so they turn away from Jesus instead of turning to Jesus. And guys, boy, oh, if you don't remember anything else this morning, that's the most unhelpful thing you can possibly do when your heart is breaking over some huge loss. And here's what I want you to remember. Guys, God is not the enemy. He's not. Ever since the rebellion of Adam and Eve and their choice to to reject what God was saying and to believe all these lies of Satan, ever since that sin just entered in the world and it drastically transformed, turned this world upside down to the point that now we in this world that we live in, there's all kinds of death and sorrow and pain and misery and suffering and wars and murders and all that stuff. A world in which tragedies happen every second of the day. But that's not God's fault. That is not his fault. He loves us. And he sent his son to die for us so he could deliver us out of this sorry world in which we find ourselves. Please remember, never forget, God is not the bad guy. And James tells us in James 1, 16 and 17, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So what I'm saying is God can always be trusted. We can always be assured of the fact that he loves us no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. So how does this help us? Well, when bad, painful, difficult, horrible things happen, don't turn from God, turn to God for his comfort, for his strength, for his guidance, for his protection. And yes, God does sometimes allow tragedies to happen. We're all living in this fallen world. But that does not at all mean that he doesn't love us. And here's something that can really help you and me to trust that this very thing, that God loves us. And it's this. Even when it makes absolutely no sense to you, trust that God knows what he's doing. Okay, even man, so you just cannot think what I can't believe this thing. He missed the. Are you kidding? You know, we we can just trust that God knows what He's doing. In verses seventeen to twenty one of John eleven, we read this: On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. I think she's just too heartbroken to even move. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Again, I'm telling you, for the life of them, they, Mary, they, this didn't compute. They just couldn't understand why Jesus hadn't come earlier. 
And when Jesus finally does come, after Lazarus has been dead and buried for four days, both Mary and Martha, separately from one another, when they see Jesus, they say, Oh, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother, he wouldn't have died. They knew if he'd been, there was no way he would have died if Jesus was there. You know, they couldn't understand then, why, 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 why didn't you come, Jesus? Why didn't you come? And we've asked those same questions of God, haven't we? You know, the mother cries, why did, did, did God, you allow my son to die in that car wreck? You, you could have prevented that. You know, if only you'd made him leave the house five minutes later, he'd be alive today. God, why did my sister get cancer? I know you could have healed her. Why didn't you? She was so young. Martha and Mary did not understand why Jesus allowed their brother to die, but Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Verse 4, he says, This sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And this is so important for us to realize, guys, because it lets us know that Jesus didn't allow Lazarus to die out of indifference. He didn't allow him to die because he didn't love him, he didn't care for him. No, there was a significant purpose behind this, this whole thing of choosing not to come to Bethany and, and heal his friend Lazarus. And so here, here was the purpose right here. This is the very end. Jesus had a three-year ministry. This is the last week of the last year, and everything was culminating to the cross. And right here at the very end, Jesus was going to perform his most amazing, spectacular miracle, a 10 on the Richter scale of miracles, you know, a miracle that would just kind of prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was who he said he was, that he's Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, and who <coughs> would come into the world to save the world. So Jesus, this miracle was this. He was going to raise a man to life who had been dead and buried for four days. Now, today, four days after burial doesn't seem that big a deal, you know, we have embalming fluids and all that stuff. But you see, in the steaming, hot, unair conditioned climate of Palestine, a dead body decomposed very, very rapidly. And the, the, the Mishnah, the Jewish book, you know, says that the identity of a corpse, a corpse could not be given after the third day of him being dead. Why? Because by then his body would be so decomposed that his face would literally be unrecognizable. Okay, kind of gives you a picture of what he's going to look like at four days. And so for Jesus to resurrect Lazarus after he died, after his body had been decomposing, that was a big miracle. That was going to bring glory to God like nothing else. In fact, you know, it was going to lead a lot of people to believe that he was the Messiah. So that's what happened. You know, that was the purpose. And that's exactly what did happen. Look at verse 45 of, of, of John 11. Therefore, and after Lazarus rises from the dead, we'll get to that in a minute. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had, and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. Verse 11 of chapter 12, for an account of him, Lazarus, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. And then in verses 17 to 19 of, of chapter 12, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Man, this thing's like a wildfire spreading. Spread the word. Many people, because they'd heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So this is what the Pharisees said. The Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Jesus knew exactly why he did not come to Bethany and heal Lazarus. But Mary and Martha didn't know that. They didn't know. Jesus didn't send a message to Mar Martha and Mary. He said, look, I got your message. I heard that Lazarus was, was uh, really sick. Here's the plan. I'm going to let him die. And you go ahead and bury him. And then I'm going to show up four days later, and I'm, I'm going to heal him, and it's going to be great. Got it? That's the plan. No, nothing. That they didn't get anything from Jesus. No word at all. And all that Mary and Martha knew from their limited perspective, the perspective that you and I live in, they asked Jesus to come and heal the brother. He didn't, so the brother died, period. That's it. Pretty rough, right? Truth is, something we just need to accept about God is that God doesn't always explain to us 
why he allows certain things to happen. Just doesn't do it. You know what? That's okay. We need to be okay with that because God is God and we're not. That's his prerogative. And what he's asking us to do is to implicitly trust him as a good, perfect, holy God that he knows what he's doing. And what we see in this story is that just because, you know, Jesus didn't heal Lazarus, just because Jesus didn't explain to Mary and Martha why he just didn't show up to heal him, that didn't mean that he didn't love them. No, he loved them a lot. Verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. No question about that. So in the face, in the face of what seems to be a senseless tragedy, you and I, No matter what's going on, no matter how badly we feel about it, we can trust that we might not know what he's doing, but he knows what he's doing. We might not understand why he doesn't choose to heal or deliver a loved one, but because of the cross, because of the cross, that's how we can always, always, always know that he loves us. Romans 5, 8. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for it. That settles that question, guys. We never have to answer, does God love me? Well, yeah, he does. He sent Jesus to die for us. That is the end of that question. You know, Julie and I and so many of you and and hundreds of of others, we we prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for a whole year for God just to come in and heal our son Bill of his cancer. And God's answer was, you know, no, it's not going to be. It's time for Bill to come on home. We don't know why God didn't heal him. You know, we don't, we don't know what his purpose was in letting him at the young age of being such a, a young man of such promise of 26. We don't know why that, why that happened. But here's what we do know. Here's what we do know. We know that God loved Bill, and we know that Bill loved God, and we know that God loves us. And knowing that, guys, I can't even begin to tell you how incredibly important that was for us to know and be assured of God's love. That helped us to get through the loss of our son. Third thing, third thing that really helps us handle the heartache of feeling that God has let us down is this. In spite of your unanswered questions and heartache, know that God cares deeply about the pain you are having to go through. He cares deeply. Listen, look in uh, verses 28 to 37. After Martha said this, she went back and called her sister Mary privately. The teacher is here, she told her, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up and hurried out to meet him. Jesus had not yet arrived in the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. The people who were in the house with Mary, comforting her, followed her when they saw her get up and hurry out. They thought that she was going to go to the grave to weep there. Mary arrived where Jesus was, and as soon as she saw him, she fell at his feet. Lord, she said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus saw her weeping, and he saw how the other people who were with her were also weeping, and his heart was touched, and he was deeply moved. Where have you buried him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they answered. Jesus wept. See how much he he loved them, the people said. But some of them said, hey, he gave sight to the blind man, didn't he? Could he not have kept Lazarus from dying? This is so important. This passage powerfully, powerfully shows us that when we're facing death, when we're facing any kind of unpleasant, horrible, tragic kind of situation, Jesus is not unconcerned. He's not uncaring. He's not emotionally detached. He's not coolly distant from the pain that we're feeling when we're just dying inside. No, this passage unmistakably shows us that he deeply cares. In this emotionally charged scene, you know, we can see that Jesus is just profoundly moved. I want you to kind of kind of picture this, this scene going on in your mind. Here's Mary, you know, the person she loved, the person who just, you know, fell at his feet and, and, and put perfume on his feet and wiped his feet with her. She's just a wreck. She's just dissolved in tears out down there at his feet. And she's having a rough time. And, and the word that says she claps into tears, the word for weeping, it specifically means not just a kind of a quiet little whimper, you know, a discreet little 
quiet. No, it's talking about loud wailing. This word describes someone who's doing just gut-wrenching crying, inconsolable crying. And Mary is in this deep, visible, emotional pain, and she's loudly crying, and she's wailing, and her friends and family, they're crying, and they're wailing, and they're overcome with sorrow, too, as as they're weeping all there together. And verse 33 says that when Jesus stood there seeing all of this, he was deeply moved and troubled. Now, this deeply moved, you got to understand what it means. In classical Greek, this word describes the snort of a horse when he's galloping along at full speed, whether in a race or in, in a war. And what it's saying that, you know, Jesus is, <laughs> he was just, he was torn up. I mean, he was just torn. He was so grieved. He was so upset. He's making these loud snorting noises, just trying to contain his emotion. And then as Jesus was led to the tomb of Lazarus, it says he wept. And the tense of the verb wept means, boom, he just burst into tears. It was like a dam exploded and all of his tears came rushing, flooding out of his eyes, down his cheeks. And you know what Jesus experienced, guys? He understood the pain that Mary and Martha were experiencing. And he understands the pain that you and I feel when we are standing at the graveside of someone that we've lost. Jesus understands, guys, never, ever forget. He's not just way out there somewhere kind of callously looking. No, he understands. He's been there. He knows the pain. He knows that feeling that in the pit of your stomach, uh, you know, when, when those tears are flowing. He knows it. He knows it. He's experienced it. In short, when we're suffering over some senseless tragedy, I don't know about you, but it sure comforts me to know that Jesus cares. Jesus cares. He feels your pain, and he's empathetic. He's sympathetic of what you and I are going through. Remember that word, deeply moved? You know, the word talking about the snorting of a horse. Also, when it's used for humans, the word describes outrage, fury, unbelievable anger. And we need to understand that this word is not just talking about Jesus' sorrow and sadness about Lazarus' death. This word also lets us know that Jesus was enraged. He was full of anger and indignation. He was so enraged, the Bible said he was troubled, which literally means he was trembling, he was shaking. In other words, he was so enraged, I think he was, he was shaking. And why, so, why was he so angry? Thought a lot about this read a lot about this. I believe, I believe that as Jesus was standing there surrounded by his weeping and wailing friends, the full, terrible impact of of the devastation of sin just came upon him like a tsunami. Dead Lazarus and his broken-hearted sisters represented all the misery, all the pain, all the suffering that sin and death had brought into this world. And this is why he was there. This is why he'd come, to undo all this horrible pain and suffering that sin and death had brought into this world. And undo it, he did. Jesus hated so much the pain and misery that sin has brought into this world that he gave his life to fix it. That's how much he hated it. That's how angry he was. Fourth way. Fourth way to handle the heartache of feeling that God has just let you down is to hang on to your faith and continue to believe in God even when your heart is broken. To hang on to your faith. Do not let go of it, to continue to believe in God, even when your heart's just, just torn up inside. <clears throat> we skip this uh, uh, part of this passage. You want to go back to it, verses 20 to 27. And here's just this amazing kind of famous interchange between Jesus and Martha uh, when Jesus comes into town. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, Lord, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask him for. Your brother will rise to life, Jesus told her. I know, she replied, that he will rise to life on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. 
and all those who live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she answered. I do believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. Now, here's what I want us to notice here. Here's what I want to, is, is, here's the thing. Martha's amazing profession of faith, I mean, clear as a bell, her profession of faith is given before Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, okay? She's expressing her faith in Jesus while her heart is still just torn up and broken. She's expressing her faith in Jesus even though she can't figure out why in the world he didn't come and heal him. She still, she believes in Jesus. She doesn't know that Jesus is going to raise Lazarus. Remember, a little bit later, we're going to see she's the one that when, they, when they, Jesus comes to the tomb and says, roll away the stone, she says, whoa, 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 time out. Wait, what? Don't do that. Don't do that, Lord. He's been decomposing in there for four days. It's going to smell bad, 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 as the Cajuns would say it. Really bad, okay? It's just not going to be, don't do it, Lord. But Martha hangs on to her faith before he raised Lazarus and while her heart was still broken. So what I'm trying to say is she doesn't give up on God just because she doesn't understand why he let all this happen. And and she continued to believe. She continued to hang on to her faith. And guys, that's what God's calling every single one of us to do. And boy, she professed that faith. Just watch how her unswerving faith in Jesus is just powerfully, powerfully affirmed. Starting at verse 38, we read this. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb, It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor for he's been in there for four days. And then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you'd see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave cloths and let him go. Wow. Talk about an amazing scene. I mean, think about it. Here's Jesus, the Lord of life, and he's squared off against his opponent, death, that has Lazarus in his grip. And Jesus calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And all of a sudden, the weeping and the wailing just stops. And all of a sudden, the crowd that's gathered around Martha and Mary, they just stand frozen in place as they're all, they're all just staring at the dark entrance of that cave. And you can imagine as they see Lazarus wrapped up like a mummy emerging from that tomb. (gasps) Just a gasp of fear and wonder must have just come out of those people. And so then this mummy, or Lazarus, walks up to Jesus and stands before the liberator, the one and only person in the world who with one word can conquer death and stands before him. And Jesus says, take his grave cloths off. Now after this, a Astounding miracle. There's a mixed reaction. A mixed reaction. Verse 45, therefore, because of this incredible resurrection, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. That was the whole purpose. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here's this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everybody's going to believe in him. And then the Romans are going to come and take away both our place and our nation. And skipping down to verse 53, so from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Now, this is, this is what always happens with Jesus. There's not a whole lot of neutral ground with Jesus. People either believe him or they don't. Either accept him or they reject him. So many put their faith in Jesus. They believed in him. But then there's some others who saw this, inc- the same miracle everybody else saw. They were right there. And instead of believing, they just ran off and told the Pharisees, kind of tattletailed. And then the Pharisees choose to believe him, to choose to, to not believe Jesus. And they choose to kill him. They don't want the apple cart of their lives up, up side down and turned away. They don't want Jesus to be in control of their lives. No, they like things just the way they are, so they reject him. 
You know, every single person in this room, without exception, has the same choice to make about Jesus. One week later, after the death and resurrection of Lazarus, comes the death and resurrection of the crucified Jesus. And the choice that every single one of us has to make, and not to choose, is to choose. The choice we have to make is, do you believe in Jesus Christ and accept him into your life as your Lord and Savior? Or do you refuse to believe in him and you reject him from being your Lord and the Savior of your life? Listen, one day, like Lazarus, you're going to die. And they're going to have a funeral for you. And your friends and your loved ones are going to be gathering around the casket. And they're going to be weeping and, and crying. And then they'll take you out to the mausoleum or to the uh, cemetery and they're going to bury you. That's going to happen to every one of us. Then what? Well, let me tell you. If while you were alive, you believed in Jesus and you accepted him into your life as your Lord and Savior, you will be resurrected and you will spend all of eternity in heaven. If, on the other hand, while you were alive, you never did believe in Jesus, you kind of thought, well, that sounds good, but I'll do that some other time. I've got some stuff I want to do first, but then I'll get around to it. And you die somehow, and you have not accepted him. Then when you die, you will not be resurrected to life in heaven. You will be spending all of eternity in hell, separated from God, having to pay for your sins forever, forever. Remember back in verse 25 what Jesus said to Martha? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then Jesus, with those penetrating eyes of his, looked right into the eyes of Martha. And she's asked him, he asked her the question, the most important question she would ever answer. And it's this, do you believe this? And her answer was, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ the Son of God, who was to come into the world. That was her answer. The question is, what's yours? What's your answer? So let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for including this passage out of the life of your Son, Lord, in your Word. We thank you, Lord, for so many uh, insights that it gives us into what's going on in our lives, Lord, as we live in this, this fallen world. And Father, I just pray for, for anyone here this morning who, who's never really understood the gospel, who has never really taken that step of faith to accept you, Lord. I just pray that right now, Lord, you might just be knocking on the door of their hearts. And Lord, you might just be preparing them and giving them desire to go ahead and step across the line and say, yes, God, I believe in you. I want you to be my Savior. So if anyone here this morning wants to pray that prayer, just pray this after me silently in your pew. Dear God, I thank you for bringing me here today. God, I realize that I have sins in my life. I realize I haven't done everything right. I know I've done a lot of things wrong. And Father, I understand that my sins are what have separated me from having a relationship with you. But thank you, God, that even in my sinful state, that you love me enough to send your son Jesus into this world, to live the life of the God-man, and to eventually die on that cross. And God, I, I, I want to, you, you to know right now that I believe in you. I believe Jesus is your son, I believe his death paid for all of my sins. And right now, God, I'm just asking you to come into my life. I accept your free gift of salvation. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And for a father, for those who are here this morning who may have come in with questions that haven't been answered, who may have been a little upset with you, wondering why you've let certain things happen. Lord, I pray that this passage will speak to them. I pray that we can find comfort, 
knowing that your love for us is unshakable, that nothing can separate us from your love, and that, God, in spite of the fact from our limited perspective, we can't figure out why certain things happen, that you know what you're doing, that you're good, that you can be trusted. So, Father, we just thank you for this morning. Lord, we do have so much to be thankful for. And especially, Lord, we're thankful for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.